finally was able to log in, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody. It's great to see all of you. Um, we're really excited about um, all the things happening in EPICS this semester. And really, this uh, lecture is to just kind of share some of the things that have been going on and get your feedback on some things we'd like to change, um, and also talk about lab use and safety before we're done. So um, this is all for returning students. Um, if anybody isn't a returning student, you can probably want to make your way back to Physics 114. Um, just a couple of schedule changes to make you aware. So one of the things, we're going to have nearly 400 students again, maybe a little over, a little less, something around that order. We probably have a smaller percentage of returning students than we've had in the past. So four, we've been running at 400. We're probably about the lowest number of returning students. So you guys will need to play an even bigger role in what's happening in EPICS. So sometimes there's good institutional knowledge that gets passed on from semester to semester. And we're not going to have you know, as much of the opportunity to do that. Sometimes there's incorrect or bad institutional knowledge about things that we do in EPICS that gets passed on from semester and semester to semester. Hopefully, this will be a good opportunity to kind of start anew. So if you really want to start, have new, a new culture on your team, new habits, this is a great opportunity to be able to take advantage of that. And hopefully, some of the things that we've been talking about um, will um, impact that or help benefit that. At the end of last semester, you all filled out a, um, well, not all of you. We had the looking forward lecture where people had an opportunity to comment on what was good and what we should change. We went through all of your feedback that you provided in that. Um, we met with advisors and really tried to think, how can we do what we're doing in EPICS better? Um, and so based on all of that, we have a couple of changes. Not Hopefully we're at the point, I like to think of everything as design. Um, and hopefully we're just making small iterations on what we're doing. We're not changing huge things about what we're doing in EPICS. But always trying uh, to, to do better in what we're doing. Um, just a couple of changes. Week 14 is the week after Thanksgiving. And I don't think that works very well for teams to prepare for design reviews. So we've had design reviews in week 14, like all last year. Um, but that really doesn't allow you to prepare. And if you're not here the weekend before, especially Tuesday teams, it gets really hard to be ready for design reviews on Tuesdays. So we are pushing design reviews to week 15 for the fall. Um, that has the complication of having everything due week 15. So you're welcome to stagger or do some of those things earlier. Like if you want to turn in you know, some of the surveys or whatever earlier, you're welcome to do some of that. But um, it just seems to me that this was the best compromise. It's not the perfect solution at all. Um, but it's just too hard to prepare for that. Um, just so you know, when I'm talking about weeks, or if you're looking at your the milestone schedule or when things are due, um, after October break, weeks begin on Wednesday and end on Tuesday. So I think it would be week nine, eight, right after October break, would be, I believe, what, October 15th through like the 20th. So for Tuesday teams, you're actually like the following week when everything's due. And then that goes until we get to Thanksgiving, and then the, the semester corrects itself again. Okay. There's not another, there, you know, we've done 2.5 or whatever, 8.5 weeks or whatever. Um, I'll just try and include the dates that are, are um, actually go within that. You can look at the calendar, um, the, the milestone schedule, to see uh, how those apply for your labs. So this is what it looks like there. Um, as I said, here, this is a schedule that's probably a little easier if you really just want to get a synopsis of what's due. 
Um, again, the milestone schedule that's in the syllabus packet really lists the objectives of what we're trying to achieve. So if there are other things that you want to do that achieve those objectives, um, you know, do a different kind of transition checklist or whatever you want to do. Um, but if you're achieving, really what's important to know is that you're achieving the objectives listed for that. Um, so my epics, in the spring we had rolled out a professional version and it had lots of problems so we went back to the old version and then over the summer we did a professional version 2.0 um, attempt to that. We did use the new MyEpics this summer, um, but it has not been used with 400 students with all of the stuff that we do. So be aware that there is a new link, so if you saved it in your bookmarks, there is a new link for it. If you run into issues, please let us know. Um, sometimes we, as much as we try and test it, until we um, have to upload 400 people's attendance, things like that, we don't, it's difficult to test some of the features of the MyEpic system. But anyway, just so you're aware. Um, in the January, I think when we had our first kind of returning student lecture, we knew Andrew was coming um, to join us in EPICS, but he hadn't joined us yet. Hopefully over the course of the spring, you got to meet Andrew. He's a former EPIC student. Um, graduated with in biomedical from um, with his bachelor's and master's um, he worked developing prosthetic devices for several years and actually really wanted to make more of a difference in the world and came back to Purdue and epics to be able to do that he's really we see him as part of the instructional team so he's not just the lab manager who's just there even though he if you have how many people have wandered by the labs on their way here. Did you notice any changes? They look great. They're really organized. He's tried to really establish, clean up things, get rid of things, um, set up workstations in 1101. All the tools are right there so you don't have to go hunt and find them. So one of our goals is to spend less time looking for uh, tools and materials and get more work done on the projects. So he spent a lot of time doing that. But he's also very much part of the instructional team. So um, in addition to just if you need software, but if you need training or whatever you need to do your project better, um, he also has a lot of project management experience and a lot of design experience. So you can go to him for help with that as well. So just wanted to, um, you know, if you don't know Andrew, you should get to know him and take advantage of all that he can offer for your team. One of the changes and kind of things we wanted to think about this semester was thinking about how to incorporate entrepreneurial thinking a little bit more in what we do within EPICS. And this is a model from the Lean Launchpad that really looks at entrepreneurship and developing those ideas more as a design process. So, um, EPICS counts as part of the entrepreneurship certificate, so we've aligned with entrepreneurship over the past several years. EPICS teams have participated in business plan competitions or idea to product competitions. However, what happens often is that the motivator becomes more of the, the business plan or winning the competition becomes the priority and not the design that we're doing for our customers. The Lean Launchpad kind of um, entrepreneurial way of, of looking at this starts to really value the users and the customers and takes that as a starting point and uses more of a design process of being able to identify that. So one of the reasons why I think this is important is that if we're successful, you know, I, I think it makes us think about the question of, so what if we are successful? How can we have the biggest impact? For example, for the Speak All app that the Glass team developed, we put it on the App Store. We had thousands of people download that, 17,000 people. The Epics team couldn't support 
uh, 17,000 downloads. If we really want to have an impact on helping kids with autism be able to communicate, how do we need to think about our design? And it may be appropriate if I'm going to do a water filter to help somebody have clean water. Am I really want to be satisfied of helping one person? Or do I want to be able to help thousands of people, if not millions of people? So just considering these kinds of things with as you, as a design constraint, being really aware of what's already out there, prior art and not reinventing the wheel, leveraging existing technology, but really thinking how can we have most impact. So we're going to try and bring in and do some skill sessions to think about this. Whoops. But um, anyway, just wanted to let you know we're, we're going to re-engage with entrepreneurship even more so that we can. Um, a number of our teams, especially our global teams, we have been um, partnering with um, the global engineering effort here. And that really is the goal to have broad impact on thousands and millions of people. So I think we're going to need to leverage this a little bit. So new roles. So we had some discussions based on a couple of different things. And one of the questions I guess we had was, what was the role of the team leader? What does a team leader do generally? On some of your teams, what was some of the responsibility? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Should set goals and delegate responsibilities. Okay. Delegate responsibilities. Right. Yes. Um, making sure all the designs are running as per plan. Okay. Yep. That is a rule. Yep. Making sure everything's on track and making adjustments for every week. Right. So what is that? The person that keeps things on track, even manages resources on a team. What is that typically called in industry? Project manager. So what we were finding is the roles and responsibilities of the team leader were better aligned if we called it a project manager um, to that. Plus, we've been talking about this tension between design and wanting to iterate and make it perfect, and the project manager needing to get the project done and get it delivered. Because as much as we like designing and as much as we're learning, unless we deliver those projects, we're not making a difference. We're not helping our community partners. So we really want to be explicit in the team leader's role or somebody's role on the team. We're proposing that instead of team leader or in addition to team leader that the role of project manager is assigned to the team leader. And that the design leads or the project leads really have a focus on design and all aspects of coordinating that. So in the MyEpic system, actually, all of these still exist. So you can assign multiple roles to a person on the team. So if you really want to still keep team leader and project manager, you can do that. If you really want to stick to project lead. But we think this aligns better with what's happening in industry and that when you go and communicate what your role is on a team, that this will, other people will understand that. We had created the project manager position, but part of, part of this discussion came out of the confusion because the way that the project manager function was more really of the project archivist with a focus on documentation and not as much on the overall resource management and making teams accountable for getting the projects delivered on time. So the project archivist, um, we renamed that old project manager role to really what, called it what it really should be called, and, and envisioning the project manager. So um, also, project partner liaison, um, those might be that you have one for your whole team, or it might be that you have one for each project, depending on how your, your projects are constructed or your team is constructed. I know all the software teams you have, you do, different projects have different project partners. Even within Glass, we had different project partners for different teams. 
So you may have one project partner liaison for your team, or you may have one for each project. So I think I just said that. So the team leader was often undefined. We really want somebody to hold that, and it aligns. So really the major responsibility is to manage the team resources to deliver quality project within budget and time constraints. When we say we're going to deliver something to our community partner, we really do it. Okay, not this, oh, we hope we're going to deliver. We want to deliver on doing that. That's one thing we're finding. We don't want any more five-year projects and epics. You know, that's, we got to get stuff out there. So part of it is figuring, too. One of the things I like about the entrepreneurship is the minimal viable product. Too often, sometimes, when we think about doing a design, we want every bell and whistle on that project. And then we never deliver it. Instead, what is the minimal viable product we can deliver that's going to make a difference? And then get that out there, get feedback on the actual use of that, and figure out what bells and whistles really are needed to do that. So it's a little bit way, a leaner way, more agile way of thinking about how we do design. Very customer-centric. That's absolutely important. User need very still human-centered approach, community driven. But I think we have to be more flexible uh, in what we do. Design lead, really just the responsibility for leading the project design aspects. So facilitating the project through all the design process. It could be technical lead, maybe another term that is used a lot in industry. We really wanted to kind of think about the project and focus on design as a lead for that. Um, they may not be doing all the design documentation or communication with the community partner, but they're responsible for all aspects of the project. And so calling that the design lead. They would be accountable to the project manager. So having the project manager, um, you know, have them report on what progress they're making, how well are they doing on their timelines. And, you know, those are the things. And, and making sure you have the resources you need to do that. So it might need a shift in team structure to meet particular needs. And that's something you can talk about um, in your team. So this is the project archivist. It's what we call the project manager. On teams that did this, we saw an improvement on design documentation. You guys will be going back to these teams, and you can see if it made a difference. So if we can improve this, I think that would be great. But from what I can tell, there was a huge improvement on design documentation. Actually, I was looking for bad design documentation, and I had trouble finding bad documentation. So I think you guys have improved tremendously. But when you go back to your projects, you really know for sure how well you did related to that. So again, the project archivist um, doesn't have to do all the documentation, but is responsible. We just find that if you don't hold somebody accountable for something, it doesn't get done. So making sure on your teams you have people accountable for things you definitely want to get done is just kind of the goal for that. So in small groups for just a couple of minutes, share your thoughts, and then you can report out. Because I'm willing to pivot on this idea if we need to, but anyway. Small groups, just kind of turn people next to you. Talk for about a minute.
mask in the true and false color. Do they need to true for number one. And yeah, I'll get to the end on that. All right. So what do you guys think? Anybody want to share thoughts? Good idea, bad idea? What do you think? Good idea? Yes? How many people, anybody think it's a bad idea? All right. Because I felt bad. You guys are one of our major stakeholders. And I hadn't had a chance. I got to run it by one student. And so I really wanted, hoped that this would, which was better than zero. But I actually do think, uh, hopefully this makes sense. We can pilot it. If we think it's a total failure, um, you know, then then we can uh, revise uh, on that. You're going to say something, Kel? Uh, the only question I have is for people that were familiar with Epic beforehand, like say companies that are coming in with Twitter, is there any way to connect with a alumni from that place and tell them about your training? Absolutely, that's a great idea. And and if you feel want to, if you can say, if you want to kind of use the dual role of project manager, team leader kinds of ideas, feel free to do that as we transition as well. So, um, you know, I think both of those, but that's a great point. And I definitely will do that with alumni and the recruiters that are coming. So that's a great point. All right. Any other questions? Okay. I have another inner um, thing that I want you to talk about. So how to make a better pig. In your small groups, what are the characteristics of good pigs? So I went and looked for pigs in different teams. I saw lots of really bad pigs, or at least ones that I didn't think would be very useful in understanding. I found a couple good pigs. So what is, why don't you think, talk in your groups real quick. What are the characteristics of good pigs? Okay, you guys are going to be responsible for holding teams accountable to their project timelines. What do you want to see? Okay? Um, talk in your small groups for a few minutes and then we'll report out. Okay, so what are some characteristics or how to make, how would you make a better pig? What, what are good pigs? And so for those who aren't familiar, pigs, progress, issues, goals, it is a reporting scheme that many teams have used. Um, so if your team isn't using some way to maybe communicate, um, you know, you might want to consider using pigs. Adam. Okay. Yep. Uh, I think a pig should be using tail. It's better to put goals. Like for each time, we should track our goals for weeks. If you're not writing the goals for each metric. Okay. Who? What? Did you? Somebody over here? Or um, one of my teams combined the goals and progress slides with that have in a PowerPoint. So instead of having your goals from last week, um, just get to not be viewed if you're currently, and then start at goals. You pulled up your slides from last week. And to do and then you put that put down a check or an access or some way to mark what you actually did 
Yep, Chris. So really utilizing our Gantt charts, our timelines effectively, we tend to create them and then forget about them. But then they're not really good, useful tools in helping us do that. So these were many of the things that we delivered, uh, that we identified as well um, with the advisors. So detailed, specific, show versus tell too. So one of the examples that I showed to the advisors is that if you've actually made a design decision or did a calculation, you could actually create a slide that shows that. So show what you have done more than just say that I've done it. The really great benefit of that, you already have that slide done when it's time for design review. You have already created that. So what a better way to kind of keep working on documentation week by week, and it can be just a little thing that you do, the diagram, the CAD, the, the model of the simulation, whatever it might be, you can actually just present that and you, then you've already got that done. So this is one way to actually get you know, documentation done as you go. Accomplishments, um, design decisions. I think that's something that doesn't always get reported with progress that's actually really important. And when you're seeing teams go through this and they've made major decisions, it's probably important to communicate that to your advisors and TAs as well as your other teammates. So making very explicit those design decisions you're making. Um, a suggestion about starting with last week's goals, you can actually just use that as your starting point. Um, yeah, issues, often it seems like it sounds like excuses. Your issues are your excuses. That isn't what issues is really. It's, these are the things that we're having trouble solving or new constraints we've identified. That's what you want to do in the issue. So if you're not, if you've identified a problem but you don't have a suggested solution, it just sounds like an excuse related to that. Goal specific, um, and you want to make sure that they're not always true, like I worked on the project. This needs to be action items that are very specific and you should assign people to that. So then when you actually pull up the next week, you can see who met their, their goals from the last week related to that. What I recommend, and I think many teams have done this, is just create one PowerPoint deck and that you keep adding to it as you go along in the semester. So you can take the last week's um, goals or action items, turn that into you know, your, the slide that you use to report progress or accomplish, accomplishments through that. And then you can draw from those, as I said, for your design review presentations and any other things? So, and ref going back to the timeline. So, really, that is something that I think can be beneficial, and I think project managers are going to really hold teams more accountable to that as well. Okay, just some general um, kind of as usual announcements, but um, we are going to be, by the end of this week, we'll have at least half of our skill sessions posted. Um, in my epic, so you'll begin to see those. This is one of the few classes you guys get to have control or have you know some say in what you learn and what you do in your um, in your classes. I'm pretty sure most of your other classes gave you the syllabus and didn't tell you you can just do which homeworks you want, right? Then do that. Take which tests you want. So really, this is an opportunity to build your resume build those skills, have experiences that you don't get in other classes. Take advantage of that. So when you see the skill, les skill session go up and you want to learn something that you want to add to your resume, you can participate in that. So take a proactive role in doing that. The other thing I need you to do is help new people on your team learn how to, to get the resources, access the resources they need to be successful through skill sessions or other things, okay? So if they don't know how to do something and, and need to learn, please help them figure out which skill sessions they need to be participating in to be successful. We're gonna do the leadership track again. I'm gonna do that with Professor Buzznell this semester. Um, she's done leadership um, classes um, 
in communication. And so we're going to do those together. They'll be different than they've been in the past on that. Um, as you start to see, I mean, we are pretty familiar with what skill sessions are needed. The advisors and the TAs know what the projects are. But if you see something that we don't have on the list, let us know. And we will try and um, get, get that added for the skill sessions. Um, this is really just a note for those people watching on video for 530. But it might help if everybody's just aware that we are having the 530 lecture this week. But after this week, we don't have the 530 lecture anymore. It doesn't meet. We'll be recording the 430 lectures. So anybody who's registered for 530 and cannot come to the 430 lecture um, should watch the video tapes. Okay? They're usually posted by Wednesday of the week. Amber helps us get that done. Um, but if things go well, they're posted by Wednesday afternoon after the lecture. Um, one thing to note is that you usually have two weeks to make that up. So we're not recording all these lectures so you can wait till the last week of classes and then figure out, oh, I'm going to watch all these lectures. Because at that point, they're really not providing much value for your project. All right? So you need to stay on that and watch them within two weeks. So make sure everybody on your team's aware of that. Um, yeah, there's five introductory lectures that are be for um, new students to EPICS. We're only in Physics 114 for those five uh, first lectures, six weeks. Um, and um, so that's more for 530. The lecture schedule is posted on the web. It's also in your syllabus packet. So take a look at that and see which ones that you want to participate in. Andrew Pierce, our lab manager, is going to be facilitating a lot of the project management and design. So he's bringing his um, industrial experience um, and will kind of facilitate, wants them to be interactive um, sessions that we can start looking at real specification development, project management, um, you know, risk analysis, all the things that kind of hit between design and uh, project management. Uh, project manager or team leader meeting for any of you who are assigned either one of those roles. Um, we're going to have a special meeting on the 8th, so after lecture, uh, the week after Labor Day um, in 1098C, and pizza will be provided for all of you. Um, budget financial, just an update. Your team continues to have $200. Um, that is allocated. So if you had leftover money, that's all gone back into the pot and everybody has $200 to start out with. Um, if your team isn't going to spend more than $200, you don't have to turn in a budget. But if you need to spend more than $200, which is many of the teams, you need to get those budgets in. You need to budget also for the, an for the year. They're annual budgets. We have a pot of money. We can allocate a percentage of that for teams. So if we allocate all of it, and you've only thought about what your needs or concerns are for the first semester, we may or may not have money um, next semester. Um, service learning grants. When I checked over the weekend, that still was not posted. If we get information on that, I really highly encourage you to uh, apply for those. We've had between sixteen dollars to $18,000 uh, from the service learning grants that have helped fund our projects. So um, if they continue to do that, um, I will pass on that information and if your team is eligible. The one thing about the service learning grants is that you have to have an external community partner. So if Purdue Space Day, even though we, they bring in 600 kids from around the state, since the community partner is actually a Purdue organization, they can't apply. So um, we really need those teams that have external community partners to absolutely apply for this. Um, we used it for Camp Riley to pay for uh, being able to do the build. Um, you can do it for project expenses. Um, I think so it can be used for travel. It can be used for a variety of different things. The constraints are, the restrictions are listed on there. And as always, no personal reimbursements. If you need to purchase something, please just talk to us and we'll figure out a way to get it done. Okay? Don't put it on your credit card or use your eBay account or any of those kinds of things. 
um, your Bitcoin, whatever, because um, uh, it makes it really difficult. Um, as a state institution who receives federal grants, we are required to follow certain protocols related to purchasing, and we are audited. So we just need to have policies that make that easy as possible. Okay, on your blue sheet, it shows some things that you're going to want to do before your first lab meeting. So if you haven't already planned, if you have a leadership role on your team, you should be working to do that because you guys will be the people that the team looks to to get started on the team. So think about what you need to do ahead of time, not when you first walk into the lab uh, related, oh yeah, I guess we got to figure out what we're doing, all right? So um, look at the blue sheet for what you need to do in lab and if you haven't crafted your team agenda, might want to look at some hints and suggestions or go to old ones related to that. Um, wanted to talk and spend just a couple of minutes about kind of Andrew Pierce spent a ton of time this summer getting the lab so much more in usable space. And so we want to just talk about some of the things that we're trying to do related to that. Sorry, we'll get. One of the things that he's added, so you're all familiar with this, but there is a small group meeting, little table we put in the point. So if you need to have yet another space to try and meet, that's available. So I wanted to let you know about that. Basically, we were asking the question, how can we get projects done faster, waste less money on supplies, because we buy stuff that we already have, um, get more done in less time, because you're not looking for tools and all of those other things, and how can we create a better learning environment? So we're asking those questions. And what Andrew has incorporated, and we began this in the spring, but I don't think as not enough people really knew what we were trying to do, so we wanted to just communicate this and have you be part of hopefully creating a new culture within Epix that makes it the coolest, most efficient place to work uh, on campus. So, um, what he borrowed from 5S, has anybody run into 5S? You know, so, in industry, as far as this is absolutely all our industrial um, advisors. Uh, we're like, oh yeah, we're familiar with this. So we're not doing this totally hardcore, but just uh, actually just drawing some inspiration um, in some of the systems. But really, the, it's a continuous improvement process, kind of like design, where we're going to be iterating and just getting better. But anyway, um, the really the big thing that we want to do is you spend a lot less time doing that non-value added activity. So actually getting some coding done on you know, that microprocessor is value added. Building a prototype, that's actually value added. Looking for the tools to do that, not value added. Trying to find the component you need in our sea of ICs, not value added. So we really want it to be so you can walk in and be working within 30 seconds or a minute in the lab. That's our goal, to be able to do that. We want to get rid of all the crap that's in the lab that's not, you know, um, so you can find what you're looking for. So if you need a particular component, you actually can find it, know, where it, know we have it, and can find it really easily. So we're doing that. Um, and really want to do safety, improve safety, project quality, and actually then, you know, be able to extend the life of the equipment. So there are five parts. Or, um, that really make up the 5S kind of philosophy and strategy. So the first one is sort, and then it's set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. And these are the English words for the Japanese words related. But when in doubt, move it out, red tag technique. So we started doing the red tags, um, and we'll continue doing that. Um, one of the activities your team might do um, early on is go through your bins and actually get rid of the crap that you have no idea uh, why it's even there 
and you don't even have any recollection of any of the project um, that it's associated with. Because um, we're wasting a lot of space and a lot of things are sitting there that aren't being used. Um, so the red tagging or the sorting is the first pillar. And there's basically two questions is, do we need this? And do we need it here? So you kind of look at, if you identify something, like do we really need this table here? If not, you can red tag it. And there's two, a few locations on lab where you can place those. Um, so part of it is to identifying things in the wrong place is part of the sorting and getting rid of that. Um, the set in order is that really the idea is that everything should have a place and a, pla um, a place for everything and everything in its place. So making sure if you haven't gone into 1101 and you're constructed workstations with the tools laid out and that they're actually a place for every tool. And so you can easily go in and identify if you don't have what you need to do your work. So we really want to set up epics totally that way so that you can walk in, immediately know if something's missing, but be able to get to work um, right away on that. Um, the UGTAs have primarily a lot of responsibility for the cleaning, but you need to clean up after yourself. We need to set up a culture of we're respecting everybody's space and that we clean up after ourselves. Every person is not above doing that cleanup. And so you'll see Andrew do it, you'll see me do it, you'll see everybody needs to participate in this. And if we all do a little bit, it just makes it really easy. Um, so just kind of leave the place, the little, leave the place better than how you found it, okay? Kind of idea of when you walk into the lab and use your space for that. And then we're doing some of this standardizing. So, and, you know, having set motors, set ICs, set co um, connectors, set tools, kind of standardize things that are available so that we can be really effective and that we can just know what we have and um, be really being able to do that. So, and then sustain is just really continuous improvement related to that. So striving for perfect productivity. All right, so what we're hoping is that you're not spending a lot of searching. There's not some secret material or things that you didn't know we had that's always frustrating when we get to the end of the semester and you're like, oh, I didn't know we had this tool, these resources, this whatever. We don't want that to be the case. We want it to be. No injuries. We've included, we've added some extra hand tools or construction like a circular saw. Um, and that may not be the right word for it. Um, and to the lab. So we're adding more capability so you can do more in our labs, but it's also increasing the safety risk. So, so we need to make sure that we're developing, you know, um, strategies, policies, ways of operating so we don't have injuries and waste. And again, walking in so that when you walk in, you know it's self-explanatory. All right. Just a second. As we all found out in January, um, we were not as aware of emergency procedures as we should have been. And so we're just going to have talk about it real quick. Um, all the advisors and TAs have been prepared, but just also to communicate what we need to do should an emergency come up again. Um, Basically, if there's any kind of serious emergency and you need to, just call 911. I know the university has implemented uh, a variety of other, like desktop um, features, um, other kinds of the text messaging, things like that. Um, you know, I think for most EPICS teams, I actually think we found out about what was happening because people had their phones and, and we got text messages. Um, that we needed to shelter in place. So I think most um, advisors will, you know, still be okay with you guys having phones and texts and we don't need to turn them off um, while you're, you know, in the lab. So we still have that as an opportunity. But then there's duplicate ways that we can find out about any emergencies and even those phones. 
So if you haven't signed up for the text alert, you can go ahead and do that. Um, if we have a fire alarm, we'll evacuate immediately, um, either in the lecture or if, especially when we're in the lab, that's when we spend the most time. I'll show you our rendezvous point in one second where we need to go if there is a fire. Um, if there's a shelter in place, we'll need to look at the Purdue website because there's different things you do depending on why there is, um, you're being told to shelter in place. So either, you know, you do one thing if it's a tornado, we do another thing. If there's a shooter, there's another thing if there's a hazmat situation. So we'll need to be looking and respond appropriately uh, to that. Um, this is the, the shooting. Um, if this were to happen here, we would turn off the lights secure the door, and make it, try and make it look like nobody's at home. Okay, is what we'll do for that. All right, there's some information in the syllabus. Basically, we'll post it on our website and email you should we need to make any changes um, based on this. Um, everybody was great last semester, responding to emails when we had to reschedule either between, between weather or the shooting, um, you know, we, we, there was a lot of adjustments last semester and, and you guys all were great with that. But anyway, just want to make sure we're better prepared um, this year. That is our rendezvous point. So if you're in Armstrong and we have to evacuate the building, please all together, if you're in a lab, go to the place between Armstrong and Push. That is the rendezvous point for all of Armstrong. So we want to try and make sure that we can make sure that everybody's out safely. Please do that because we don't want to have to send in a firefighter to go rescue somebody who just left to go home or something like that, okay? So please check in with your TA, your advisor, team leader, project manager on before you would uh, leave really to that. Okay, again, just a reminder for 5.30, we'll only meet next week. And parting words. So it's not too late to join. Love to get over 400 students in EPICS if we can. Um, if, when you leave, I need you to turn in your lab safety form. So that's one of the, the white page that's in your packet. And on your Scantron, if you're not already 100% familiar with this, true for number one, I need your ID on there and your name. If you want to write in on the places where there's space for uh, writing your team, that just can help us if there's any issues, but it's not needed um, absolutely for you to get credit for it. Okay? Have a great semester, and um, I'll be up here if you have any questions. Turn in um, any of the things to our TA back there. <laughs>